Good evening and welcome everyone to the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition's webinar entitled, An American System Policy Can Beat Any Recession and Drive an Economic Renaissance. Now, some of you may be thinking to yourselves, what do they mean by that? Well, a national infrastructure bank is an American tradition, an American idea that we have successfully used four times in our nation's history and an idea that is now being copied around the globe by other countries as they make the required investments in their infrastructure. The National Infrastructure Bank will be transformative, shifting the US economy from excessive consumerism to investment in public goods, thereby raising the standard of living for millions of Americans while addressing some of our most pressing issues as a nation. My name is Julie Olson, and I will be your moderator this evening. I've spent my career in the private sector in business where I've watched in dismay as the United States has lost critical manufacturing capacity to competitors overseas, and firmly believe that a national infrastructure bank is a long-term solution to this long-term problem that has plagued our country. I'm also the chair of the Progressive Caucus for the Alaska Democrats. We have a lineup of superstars this evening on our panel, and I think you all will find it very educational and interesting as we listen to their presentations this evening. I do want to let everyone know that we are disabling the chat so that everyone can focus on the presentations, but please, uh, if you have a question or a comment that comes to you over the course of the presentations, write it down. We are going to try to get to everybody during the Q&A at the end of, towards the end of our meeting. So th thanks again for being here. And with that, we are going to go right to our first speaker. Uh, we have with us Alfeka Mutardi. She is a former uh, economist with the International Monetary Fund where she traveled the globe, giving other countries advice on how to arrange their country's finances for the better. So she is eminently qualified for her position today as the Chief Economist for the National Infrastructure Bank. Alfeka? Good evening to everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Alfeka Mutardi, and I would like to open up this evening's uh, meeting by just giving you a quick uh, um, appraisal of where we are with our National Infrastructure Bank bill, also where we are with the economy, and maybe just kind of give a little setup on some of the other presenters who are going to talk to you about how this um, American system can jumpstart our economy and fix all of our infrastructure as well. So um, as we talked about last time, we just have reintroduced our bill. It has a new bill number, HR 4052. Um, if any of you would like to see Congressman Danny Davis's presentation on reintroducing the bill, it is up on our website. It's a, an excellent presentation up on our website, nibcoalition.com. What this bill does is it creates a $5 trillion public bank to lend for infrastructure projects all across the country. Been done four times before, as Julie mentioned, very successfully. Um, but in today's world, as in earlier periods, we do not have the money in budgets, in the federal budget and state and local budgets, other means to finance infrastructure. And now we have a big, huge backlog of infrastructure projects that need attending to. And this bank will complement budgets and provide the financing for all of that. Already, we have two co-sponsors on our bill, uh, Barbara Lee from California and Eric Swalwell from California. Our kudos to Don Sifkas for being the first out of the, the bat to, uh, to get on uh, representatives to sign on the bill. And we hope that all of the other volunteers in other states, especially for earlier sign-ons, there's about 13 members of Congress who signed on earlier and are still around, go out and get those congressmen to re-sign up back onto the bill. Um, that's our next um, uh, you know, uh, effort uh, that we're pushing hard for. And also anybody that can bring on a Republican, we have really been trying to bring on Republican co-sponsors, not gone so well so far. And that's why we're moving ahead with this bill because things are critical and we really need to get moving forward with um, this legislation. So that's where we are in the bill. How are we doing on the economy? Well, um, there is good news and there is bad news. Uh, the good news is that the economy does seem to still be fairly robust. 
Uh, we've had an upward uh, revision in the growth for the first quarter of 2023. There's still strong consumer demand out there and some manufacturing construction. However, uh, manufacturing output, which is a leading indicator for the economy, has fallen for the eighth straight month through June. And also the leading economic indicators index is also again down all the way through uh, May. So um, there are different um, signals from the economy. The annual um, inflation rate in June fell to 3%. Here's a graph of what it looks like. And everybody's saying, oh, well, wow, that's really a big improvement. Uh, so maybe we can stop with the Federal Reserve policy to push down on inflation. But when you look at the underlying numbers underneath this 3%, at something called the core prices, that is taking out the effects of food and energy prices, that was still hovering at 4.8%. And that's twice, two and a half times the Fed target uh, for inflation for that core number of 2%. So that means that the Fed is likely to keep on pushing against inflation. Also disturbing was the fact that most of that rent uh, CPI increase in June uh, was accounted for by rising rents. Uh, so that accounted for 70% of the increase. So those rising rents are still rolling in uh, slowly over to the CPI, and that's very disturbing. And also core services was running hot at 6.2%. So we're not doing that well on the uh, inflation indicator. The labor market remains tight. We put in another 2009 uh, 209,000 jobs in June. Unemployment fell back to 3.6%. Uh, co companies are hiring faster than they're laying off. So the job market is still quite strong. Uh, the, the Fed at its last meeting decided to keep its interest rates without any change at five to five and a quarter percent in June. But it did promise because of the inflation outlook to have two further rate increases this year, and that will push the economy downward. Deposits are still dra draining out of the banking system uh, where large depositors are looking for better uh, returns or yields on their uh, deposits, uh, upwards of 5%. They're, so they're taking them out of the banking system. And then also the US Treasury, as I discussed in my last newsletter, is going to be sucking out another trillion dollars in deposits from this banking system as it refills its own checking account that it holds with the Fed uh, that it ran down uh, during the, the debt um, negotiations. And interest on the national debt is exploding and banks are still vulnerable. So bondholders are not uh, unevenly decided on where the economy is going. Some predict that there will be stagflation which is high inflation with low growth, that's not good. Uh, others call on the Fed to ease off on further rate increases, but still others say the Fed must bring inflation down to 2%. So either we're going to have stagflation or more likely a recession with a lagged effect from the Fed continuing to push down on the money supply. The macro trends are also not good. Uh, we're ending the $4 trillion fiscal stimulus when the, the budget gave away a lot of money uh, to bring us out of the COVID recession. Some of that money is still lingering around in the system, and that's contributing to the consumer demand. Uh, but uh, tight, with tighter money conditions and banks cutting back on credit, uh, we're pretty sure to go into a recession. The problem is that there'll not be any chance for uh, deficit spending to get us out of a recession, that National Infrastructure Bank is the only policy that could possibly dig us out. So uh, that's where we are in the economy. Um, I wanted to uh, uh, just set up a couple of discussions I've seen in the press about the fact that even though we've had uh, an Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act passed a year ago, uh, we still do not have enough money around to cover all of our infrastructure needs. And I always go back to my favorite table where I compare what the National Infrastructure Bank will provide in lending $5 trillion or $5,000 billion compared to the bipartisan infrastructure law that's only a tenth of that money. And that means that there's not simply not enough funding in this new law to cover all of our infrastructure needs. Not the gap 
that was identified by the American Society of Civil Engineers. We need $2.6 trillion in these different categories, nor the other important infrastructure we need, like affordable housing, high-speed rail, and big water projects to address drought in places where we grow our food. So overall, there's not enough money. The rollout of the IIJA has been slow, especially for competitive grants. There is now a new draft House bill that will cover that will cut uh, the spending in 2024 from the IIJA upwards by 80 percent. That'll be bad for passenger rail and high speed rail. And then other sectors are showing really a lot of strains on the fact that we don't have enough money for infrastructure, especially the electric grid. It's not ready for electric vehicles. Climate change is really uh, contributing to significant demand for electricity. Uh, the grid needs to double in size and it needs to be reorganized because currently it's just organized as little um, utility uh, grids all over the country. And they're not inclined to build new grid capacity to move power from renewable sources in, in rural areas to urban centers. And we need to double the size of our grid. Housing is another uh, very serious problem. We're, we're facing a production cliff uh, stymied by um, high interest rates and construction costs. And there are ev evictions going on. State construction is way too little to cover the whole thing. The National Low Income Housing Coalition estimates we need 7.3 million units of affordable housing for the very lowest income earners. The National Infrastructure Bank will provide all of those. And then freight rail is still causing a lot of problems in our transportation system. We had another derailment and chemical spill. Um, local governments are worried about these long trains that are moving slowly through their jurisdictions and blocking intersect ro intersections and roads, especially for emergency vehicles. And they're tr trying to implement their own legislation. Uh, they, uh, they, there is funding in the bipartisan bill for fixing 400 um, rail in intersections, intersections with roads, but we have 200,000 more of them that need uh, funding to, to, to fix this transportation problem. And global warming is illustrating that we need to protect our infrastructure from flooding, drought, heat, wildfires, rising sea levels, all of that is a concern in this today's warming world. So, uh, the, I wanted to emphasize one more time how this um, uh, infrastructure bank really vitalizes the American economy. And you can look at that viewed from the point of view of who would be the borrower for these infrastructure projects. And that would be state and local governments. Anybody that owns public infrastructure can come in directly and request a loan for their infrastructure project. But the the, the $24,000 question is, can they pay back these loans? And the answer is absolutely, yes, they can pay them back. Here's a picture, they'll pay them back out of their revenues. And here's a picture of what state and local government revenues look like. What we know is that whenever we have a recession uh, shown by these gray lines on this graph right here, state revenues collapse. And whenever we come out of recession, they recover. And uh, strangely enough, they had a huge dollop of money come in. This was part of the $4 trillion exercise to send money from the federal government to states as a, um, um, a remedy for the COVID uh, economic downturn. That's not gonna happen again. Um, but what we know is that if we can get growth rate up much higher than it has been, and we can double economic growth in the United States from up to 5%, uh, over average on an average, which is where it was the last time that we had a national infrastructure bank like this, then we'll have lots of revenues coming in to state and local governments to pay back these loans. So we'll fix infrastructure and the national infrastructure bank will be an engine for growth in the economy. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Elfek. I really appreciate that. Um, we are going to go to our next speaker. We are fortunate to have her here. She is an economist, an author, a journalist and a public speaker. Please welcome Dr. Nomi Prince. Um, hi, everybody. Hope you're doing well. I'm wondering how many of you are in a state where it's really, really hot right now. Um, ex show of hands. Um, and I'm so glad that Alfeca 
um, among all of the other points that she stressed in her presentation, actually talked about the climate, the weather, heat, energy, and how our infrastructure, among other things, but in particular, as it pertains to the summer and the heat, um, is, is under such stress. Because there, there's a few things going on here. One is um, something else I'll fact mention, which is the size of, of the US debt. And part of the size of the US debt payments has increased by the 10 uh, rate hikes that the Federal Reserve has done since last March by five points um, in total. And yes, they did pause um, in June. But we spend $476 billion in 2022 on just interest rate uh, payments to our national debt. That doesn't include the state debt, the local debt, or anything else. And that number grew by 35% uh, from $352 billion in 2021. And that number is equivalent to 2% of our GDP. So if the Fed were to take a look at for example, where we are at in their inflation fight, how the current status of interest rates has impacted the ability of banks to lend, um, and how they are determined to continue to fight inflation while increasing the, the basically uh, cost of bearing the government's debt by more than the economy is actually growing, um, which in their June meeting, they also talked about being 1.1% this year and 1% uh, next year in their own forecast, that effectively uh, the amount of our debt payments outpaces our growth as, as an economy. So um, if they were to look at sort of all these numbers, uh, they, they probably wouldn't be talking about continuing to, to raise rates to fight inflation and take a look at how to manage um, just, just the process of, of rate payments. But, but that's not their job. That's not what they're doing. And so as a result, we have uh, the other thing that Alfeca talked about, which is which is a sort of damaged banking system uh, for multiple reasons historically, but more recently, um, because the assets of banks hold um, relative to the deposits that they hold in treasury bonds um, have effectively been depreciating in value. So in other words, the, the treasury bonds that they held as rates have gone up by math have gone down in value. So they're holding less valuable treasuries on their books against deposits that depositors have been trying to get out of. We've talked about this uh, you know, in, in other meetings, but the, the sort of runs on banks, Silicon Valley Bank, Signature Bank, First Republic, the 722 banks that the Fed itself has recognized as being possibly at risk because of deposit extractions, because they don't have enough assets or treasury value on the other side of their books to pay for, um, for those deposit extractions are, are all sort of at risk. So what does that mean in total? Without getting into the nuts and bolts of how banks should be better regulated and better preserved and, and all of that, that um, in terms of their, their general budgets and their books. Well, it means that they can't lend or it means it means that they're more and more choosy in how they lend, which is how we know that they're not lending for um, those last mile infrastructure projects that would fall after um, any of the existing federal funding is, is used or any of the existing state or local funding is used. It's just not their MO right now. Their MO continues to be um, a sort of form of survival. So aside from everything else that had happened before a year and a half ago, um, which was after we had talked about the initial versions of the infrastructure bank bill, um, we've also had these higher rates, which is basically dug into uh, the ability or the desire of banks to lend even more so. Um, so, so we have that situation where we're basically not growing our economy because the growth we are having is basically being paid for in the debt that we've, we've basically taken on at higher rates. And those higher rates are impeding the ability um, of banks to lend to the infrastructure that we need to grow our economy. So this is a complete catch-22. But putting all that aside as, as the, the sort of big backdrop that we have as to why that the big idea of the National Infrastructure Bank makes so much sense now and more sense now than it's done before is the fact that every single congressperson and every single senator is probably in a state that's really hot right now. So getting back to it being really hot right now um, and, and us looking forward to by almost every forecast um, from every credible institution out there another record year of heat in 2023, not just in the United States, but globally. So that impacts, for example, our ability to export, say, natural gas, of which we're the number one exporter of liquid natural gas to other countries, as well as to use it here, um, which puts more stress on our power grids, which are already in need of updating and upgrading. And that is aside from 
um, as Elfeka mentioned, all the renewable forms of energy that want to attach to the existing grids that we have, that we've also talked about here in the past, um, that, that, that don't have a place to basically connect into without also harming the capacity that these power grids have to function. And then you throw into that power outages or brownouts or heat demand or excessive heat demand and electricity needs from that for us to be cool, for businesses to to be cool um, in, in this summer, not even to mention what could happen when things get cooler in the colder in the winter and we start having more and more of that extreme temperature. Um, and we just have the necessity for every single Senator and Congressperson to take a look at their own personal wants and needs, forgetting the big idea. And I know we talk about the big ideas being the important idea here, I'm just kind of switching gears and look at the small idea for their states. The small idea is to keep their people from sweltering, right? It's to keep their people from dying from heat, um, heat related um, sort of external factors. It's, it's the ability of certain states to um, maintain the power that they have, certain states to export the power that they do export in order to grow their own state economies. And, and as Elfeka showed, when the state economies grow, they're able to also repay loans on the infrastructure within their own state. So there's a net positive effect all around. And, and so I think, um, and it's great that we have uh, Barbara Lee on board. It's great they have Sue on board. Of course, that Danny Davis re, re, um, reissue the bill. But in terms of getting Republicans, in terms of getting anybody extra on this bill, on this bill right now, um, I think we have the opportunity of heat um, and the opportunity of, of where the climate is right now. Not talking about climate change, not even talking about what, what, what are good renewable resources to tie into the grid, but actually saying, look, there, there's a monetary situation here, which is that we effectively are showing right now, yet again, this summer, um, that we need better power grids and we need better infrastructure on, on multiples of both cleaning the energy that we have, expanding our renewable energy, and also looking at sort of the natural gas, the sort of capacity of the energy that we have that runs a lot of the electricity that, that is run in this country, um, and, and looking at it in a way that requires things to be updated and upgraded on a state-by-state -state level. The, the Infrastructure Act, for example, if we look at Texas, which is like the hottest state in, in the country. Um, and not by much, because every state is looking at, again, rising heat, um, and we're only midway through the summer. Um, they receive about $66 billion in sort of funds and subsidies and all sorts of other things from the Bipartisan Infrastructure Act. They also have allocated about uh, a little less than a billion dollars in, in addition to, to that, so a much more smaller amount recently in the state legislature of Texas to expand on their power grid specifically because of what's happening in the summer and also to expand to, to renewables and cleaner emission standards and so forth, and that's Texas. Um, that's a fraction of what is needed to actually complete these jobs. So if I were to look at sort of targets, um, and for all of us, me and myself, and whoever we're, we're talking to targets within states, um, within the Senate and within the, the House, uh, that every single one of these individuals is facing an energy crisis effectively right now. Um, and it can be monetized um, by the current budget that's going towards power grid upgrades and updates and what's going to electrification and so forth, uh, combining that with weather and looking at what they need to actually complete these projects that are on deck um, and do them over a way that we can actually continue to grow their economy. So, um, so, I, I, so one of the things I've been thinking about, for example, th those numbers in Texas is that we, we're, and, and we do this a lot, but you know, presenting all the individuals um, in this sphere um, who can actually sign on to this bill for their own personal reasons, like getting elected and keeping people cold um, and keeping heat um, you know, for them in the winter and keeping power outages from happening and use that as a kind of catalyst at this particular moment um, to do a roundup of, of signatures. So um, I actually kind of want to open that to, to, to people here. And I know there's going to be other speakers, but, but I just think we have this I keep looking at the National Infrastructure Bank as having all these multiple opportunities because it's such a necessary and, and, and required thing for our country's economy. We all know that on this call, but, 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 but there's all these sort of mini opportunities that, that are presented to us as well, which is how do we get signatures, um, which is what we've discussed here a lot, and, and how do we get them now, and now it's hot. And so there are numbers that, that are individualized per state that, that I think we can, we can do pretty quickly and just be like, look, is it hot where you are? Are you concerned about power outages? Are you concerned about your grid? Well, all right, this is what you have budgeted from national. This is what you have budgeted local. And this is what you actually need. Well, here's what the National Infrastructure Bank can actually do to finish that job.
Thank, thank you, Naomi, really appreciate that. Uh, I just wanna add in uh, um, electricity consumption, heat, that's an extremely important issue. And uh, here recently, the coalition has been doing a lot of work in Arizona, where of course they're not only facing heat, but they are facing a historic drought, a mega drought that's, that's um, across the Midwest. And I think it affects you there in Los Angeles, uh, Naomi, where you are. Um, it's a historic drought and Phoenix, which has been one of the fastest growing metropolitan areas in the US for years, they are now putting a moratorium moratorium on development because they, they can't allow any more housing because there's not enough water and they're facing having no water in the future. So right. these are extremely important um, uh, climate types of crises that are facing us, but it's something that people can put a monetary value on. When developers hear that they are not going to be allowed to put in a new subdivision or build another house because there's no water, it kind of stops them abruptly in their tracks and they start um, looking at these particular issues in a different way. So, so thank you for bringing your perspective here to our meeting tonight. Um, next, what I would like to do is um, turn to another one of our speakers who uh, um, writes books on history and politics. He has been a professor at Georgetown University, both in their MBA program where he taught technology management and also um, uh, taught, I believe, in the business or the government department. Um, so he's an author of a new book that's just out this year called Unlikely Heroes. Franklin Roosevelt, his four lieutenants and the world they made. Please welcome Derek Liebert. Yeah, I'm honored to be included in the gathering. And there is a wealth of new material that has become available on Franklin Roosevelt's presidency. And if when we examine such material, we can strikingly see the continuity between the challenges America faced during the 1930s and ironically that we in many ways are reliving today. You had mentioned climate change, for instance. That was a stark issue of the mid 1930s to recall simply the Dust Bowl era and other challenges to climate. There was in the city such as Chicago, a lower eviction rate than exists today in Chicago, even during the depth of the depression. And amid the depth of the depression, America spent more of its GDP on national infrastructure than it does today. So we see so many of these continuities. And when we reflect on how America faced emergency, faced all the challenges of the 30s, we can think of that as an era in which America got things done and in which an initial skepticism about government, the familiar rugged individualism, to use the phrase of the Hoover administration, how during the 30s, it became nearly bipartisan that government had a central role in the well being of its citizenry, protecting the citizens during peacetime as federal government would during war. It became a belief that was nearly bipartisan because. Look at how the Republican Party in its 1936 presidential ticket and its 1940 presidential ticket rallied nearly behind the policies of FDR and his Democratic administration by having really a lukewarm New Deal. By 1940, the Republicans were no longer calling for dropping social security. They were no longer calling for dropping a role of the federal government in soil erosion. They were no longer opposing unionization of labor. By 1940, on the cusp of America's entry into World War II, there had developed a consensus 
that Washington properly led could get things done. And it was a new perspective on the role of the central government. So as we built a new infrastructure to think of what was accomplished in great cities such as New York to address rural electrification as well, to address the policies of that era on climate and agricultural equity as well, there became a revived new belief in government, which I would argue is sorely needed today. A demonstration that yes, government could work. It was an era to be sure that had fewer regulations than can hobble so many government projects today. It was much easier, for instance, to build a tunnel under the Hudson in New York City, which could be accomplished in three years, in contrast to the latest tunnel building project under the Hudson today, which is going to extend well into the 1930s. Finally, in this achievement of a revived faith in government, FDR, as you know, in 1944, introduced an economic bill of rights because there had been such a backing that government not only had a responsibility for the betterment of its citizens and the betterment of our infrastructure, to be sure, but that government could accomplish it that the notion of national health care was an enviable objective. And it would always be a, a source of sadness to FDR and to Francis Perkins, his secretary of labor and a prime driver of the New Deal, that they were not able to achieve national health care. But they revamped the way Americans thought of their government and of what government could accomplish. And there is a way to measure the successes of that era that is worth reflecting on today amidst our time of, of terrible political polarization and indeed extremist violence which was, to be sure, a problem that the Roosevelt administration faced in the 1930s. There is a way to think of how to use government and to use government projects to revive a faith in government. Now, at Franklin Roosevelt's inauguration, it was held on March 4th, 1933. That was under the old constitutional calendar for inaugurating a president. It would not change for a, a few more years to January 20th. FDR was inaugurated on March 4th, 1933. Now the prayers that surrounded those festivities used the commonplace description of the United States that had been used for scores and scores of prior years. The prayers were for President Franklin Delano Roosevelt, President of these United States of America. In 1933, it was still commonplace to speak of our nation as these United States of America. By 1945, at the end of Roosevelt's presidency, when he died on April 12th, 1945, no one was speaking anymore of these United States of America. America was triumphant. America had survived and overcome the depression and on top of that had rescued civilization itself during World War II. And what had been achieved and what is achievable now is to think of ourselves as one nation. And in 1945, 
the common place description of our country was the United States of America as it is today. And when we reflect on polarization, even extremist violence, we can think of the missions of government as a means also of bringing our country together again by showing what can be accomplished, what can be achieved, and how. Thank you. Thank you, Derek. We really appreciate you being here, and I'm sure you'll get some questions in the Q&A. Um, we also are going to put up a slide showing your new book that's out, so that sounds very interesting. Um, next, uh, I would like to introduce to y'all uh, Ellen Brown, she is an attorney and the chair of the Public Banking Institute. So um, public banking has really seen a resurgence in interest around the country. I know there are active groups in multiple states that are pushing for uh, statewide public or state um, uh, public banks. And so um, we really appreciate Ellen being here and we're happy to hear what she has to say. Ellen? Uh, thanks, Julie. So for decades, the U.S. has focused on high-tech industry outsourcing labor uh, until COVID happened in the lockdowns. And then we realized we had a supply chain problem. We couldn't get cheap things from China and Vietnam, et cetera, so, so easily. And then we had the UK, Ukraine war and sanctions, which cut us off, of course, from Russia and countries dealing with Russia. So we re realized we needed to be self-sufficient. We need to re-industrialize, as it is said. Um, so the call today is to onshore our manufacturing, but the question is, where do we get the money for it? Um, the federal debt is at $32.5 trillion, which is well over the debt ceiling. We just had a debt ceiling crisis and debate. <laughs> And uh, as you can see from this pie chart, more than half of the discretionary spending goes to the military, and that budget always seems to be untouchable. So there is very little left over and very little has been allocated for uh, infrastructure and development. So like Roosevelt and like um, et cetera, the Hamilton, et cetera, we need a workaround, but we've been here before and we know how to do it. We can use the American system. Uh, at the beginning of the country in 1791, the country was drowning in debt. Uh, Hamilton wrote four uh, papers on the economy. Uh, one was the first report, public on, first report on the public credit in which he said that the um, country had, was $40 million in domestic debt. Of course, at that time, a million was way, that was a huge amount of money, 12 million in foreign debt and 25 million in state debt. So these were the colonies that had become states. And there was a big debate in Congress whether, whether um, the national government should undertake these debts. But Hamilton said, yes, they should and could, and he had an idea for how to do it. So the total was $77 million, which is huge. Um, so his idea was um, debt to equity. Uh, he solved the problem by turning the debt into capital for the first bank of the United States. State debt was accepted in partial payment for stock in the bank. And then the bank leveraged that capital into credit, which is what all banks do. Um, but typically what, what they do today is when they issue credit, like you can issue 10 times as much credit on your books as you have capital. And usually that's done just by writing um, deposits into the deposit account of the borrower. But at that time, it was done by actually issuing paper currency. So this was the first national currency it was issued by this bank, uh, leveraging the capital that they had in the bank. So it was based on the fractional reserve model, which was developed by the Bank of England, but it was used for a different purpose by Hamilton's bank. The primary function in the first US bank was to issue credit to the government and private interests for internal improvements and other economic development. Hamilton wrote about that in his report on the subject of manufacturers. So it was a national infrastructure and development bank, and so was the second U.S. bank. But of course, uh, Andrew Jackson declared war on the second U.S. bank and shut it down. So Lincoln, when he came into office, needed another workaround. He was faced with um, a civil war and 
the British backed bakers were offering 24 to 36% interest on loans. So that would have left the country hugely in debt and basically enslaved. But, you know, we would have been back in slavery to the British bakers or the British backed bakers. Um, so what Lincoln did instead was to return to the system of the American colonists, which th they issued their own paper script, which worked very well until King George said they couldn't do it. And that was supposedly a major trigger of the American Revolution. Uh, so that was one way he got around the debt. And another way was he founded the national bank system, or he, at least his government did, his treasury did. Um, national banks had to capitalize their bank notes with government debt. So again, debt was turned into equity. And with that money, not only did they uh, did the North win the war, but uh, they funded rapid, rapid economic development, most famously the Transcontinental Railroad, which linked both sides of the country together by 1869, uh, financed in part with treasury sec security. So again, debt was used. And um, this through this mechanism, not only did we get this railroad basically for free, but it returned a profit to the government. Uh, and many other developments occurred then too, including uh, increase in transportation infrastructure, allowed, allowed frank, uh, factory output to boom and um, mechanization allowed agriculture to flourish. And then our greatest challenge, as we just heard, was in the 1930s, of course, that was the Great Depression when the banks were bankrupt and weren't lending and uh, the people were out of work. So Roosevelt then uh, relied on the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was also based on the Hamiltonian model. Uh, started with $500 million in capitalization, it issued bonds, it lent or invested over $40 billion over the next 25 years, funded the New Deal in World War II, rebuilt a depressed economy, and returned a net profit again to the government. So we need something similar. We need an off-budget financing like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which was able to fund programs without legislative approval and without counting toward budget expenditures. And for that, of course, <laughs> we're proposing the National Infrastructure Bank, HR 4052. Um, <clears throat> unlike the RFC, the National Infrastructure Bank would be designed to be a depository bank, which means it could leverage its funds at 10 times capital. And as Elfeca pointed out, in order to pay back these loans, they can use revenue bonds, which is what was done uh, in the 1930s. So the state and local governments that didn't have the money at the time could fund the loans with the produce, what the fees from whatever the um, infrastructure or whatever the loans created, like if you create high-speed rail, the fees from the passengers and the freight could pay back the loan. So like Washington, Lincoln, and Roosevelt, we could turn debt into equity for infrastructure development and create a 21st century reindustrial revolution. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ellen. Great presentation. Really appreciate that. And now for our final speaker of the evening, we are going to go with Dr. Andrew Winnick. He is a professor of macroeconomics with a specialty in monetary theory uh, from Cal State University in Los Angeles. Uh, professor Winnick. Thank you very much. I'm going to, well, first I'll take my cap off. <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to take a little different, a little different tone. Um, Everything that's been said, I agree with and, and, and would, 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 would second. But I want to make a different point. As we speak, uh, two of my kids and my wife are in, are in Europe. Uh, she, she's originally from Germany. When I teach, one of the things I end up having to tell my students is mm -hmm. they don't know it, but they have been brainwashed to believe that no matter how bad it is here, it's worse every place else. And that's a lie. That's simply not true. Uh, the healthcare system, Germany has had a guaranteed health insurance for every citizen since 1895 in Bismarck. You have high speed train trains. You can go from Naples to Edinburgh, Scotland. You can go from Lisbon to Czechoslovakia by high speed train. We, can, we, we can't build one from 
LA to San Francisco. The, the, point of, the point I want to make is there are ways of solving problems. And the attitude of a lot of people in the world now is they come to the States compared to the big industrial countries. They talk about us as a third world country. We have the highest mortality rate of women in childbirth of any industrial country. We pay twice as much for health care as any other major industrial country. And our, and our survival rates, when you come to having a heart attack or cancer, are worse than almost most of the major industrial countries. We, we really have, have to make people understand that we have a serious, serious problem. And it's solvable. It's not impossible. These other countries did it. We can do it. It, it, we, we are going to have to find ways around it. The traditional way of doing this sort of thing, which is go through the, the federal legislation and what have you, right now is not going to work. Our country is riven in a way that has not been for many years. The, the likelihood of getting major expenditure programs through, COVID did it. You know, we got some big programs through even under, even under Trump, we, some big expenditures, you know, PPP program and so forth. But basically, we're going to have, have to convince people, one, that they have major problems and illuminate it. You know, why do we not have high-speed internet available to every citizen? You know, why, why do we have a potential energy of wind energy up the, up, up the uh, Mississippi River that could supply the whole eastern half of the country, except there's no electric grid to, supply, to, move, to move that electricity? I mean, on and on and on. I could go on with the examples. I don't want to do that. The, the point I want to make is, there's a sort of a three or four step problem. It is not okay here that we have really major problems that they need to be solved. We're the only industrial country in the world where life expectancy is going down. Then the second thing is we have to admit that our the political system is highly unlikely, maybe impossible given the, de the debt structure and given the political divisions to solve it in the usual ways with federal spending. And then convince people there is a, there is a way, as has been explained by a number of people already this evening. You know, talking about what, when we did this with, with the first and second bank and and the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, what have you. There are there is a model, and convince people that that model is viable. And that and that is a statement that infrastructure and that sort of thing was used to be a bipartisan issue. And it's going to be interesting to see whether we can do that again, is basically convince the at least a core of Republicans that these problems are affecting their constituencies. It's affecting every state, red and blue, and they, these problems need to be solved. C climate change, obviously, is, is a priority at the moment, but that's not the only one. And th th this can be done. And, and I, that's the point I want to, I want to re really make, that there's a need for a re-education and you know that's just part of the discussion that we need to be having when we're when we're lobbying the Congress people to get, enable this legislation. The other thing I want to point out is, and we have some people that are on on, on the uh, Walt, Walt McCree and and Ellen and others uh, have been working on the public banking thing. You know, the LA City Council funded a, a study to get the, to get a a public bank started in LA County. And the vote was 12 to nothing to fate in favor. 12 to nothing. That's amazing. San Francisco, San Francisco is moving. The East Bay is moving. We actually have in California a law that passed a couple of years ago that authorizes 10 regional, regional within California, public banks. The, 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 the topic is on the, on the agenda is what I'm trying to say. There's an awareness now. You know, the, the, these banks that I'm talking about now are different than the infrastructure bank. They're meant as basically a depository for public monies. When, when cities and all and, and counties collect money, what do they do with it? Well, they deposit it until they spend it. Where do they deposit it? In the big banks. What do the big banks do with it? Whatever they damn well please in, in terms of the profit. If you have a public bank, you put that money into the public bank, you have a board of directors that who has policies that are part, in part dictated by the public officials in their area. And instead of using it for whatever Citibank wants to do with it, you do affordable housing. You do infrastructure. Maybe you do some infrastructure locally. You know, you can do a whole variety of things that are social priorities. That concept is beginning to catch on. 
And I think we, we really have to understand that we have a potential now historically, both because of need and because of possibility that, we, that this is doable. We really have to convince that. And that's what we're gonna to have to convince our Congress people of, because we cannot get a National Infrastructure Bank without at least approval from the, from the federal government through the Congress. And the point, the point we have to make, and I've spent in other contexts, you know, various times lobbying different Congress people, they can be reached. You know, but they, they have to understand it's in their best interest, it's in the best interest of their, of their constituency, and that it's feasible. This is not pie in the sky. It can be done. And, you know, I think I'm going to stop with that. I, I could go on, but I think a lot of what I, I could talk about in terms of the various projects that need to be done that other people have talked about, and we can talk about in the Q&A. So I'll stop. Thank you, Andy. Uh, you made a great point there. And um, I think we, we need to work on returning America to being exceptional and uh, in reality. And um, I think the more people become aware of our shortcomings and how far, far behind we are falling behind other countries in terms of our infrastructure, there'll be more impetus to, to do something. Um, so um, I have a couple slides I wanna show um, before we go to our Q&A. And so first of all, I would like to uh, show you a slide that shows our speakers books that are all available on amazon.com. Here we go. Ellen's book, uh, From Austerity to Prosperity, The Public Bank Solution. Here we have uh, Derek Liebert's book, Unlikely Heroes, uh, available on Amazon. And uh, Nomi Prince's book, Permanent Distortion. So um, please support our speakers if you're so inclined and take a look at their books on amazon.com. Okay, um, next, uh, while we're talking about media, uh, I wanted to let everyone know that um, the uh, infrastructure bank bill that was introduced by Danny Davis was actually written up in the bond buyers. So this is a, um, a publication, a media publication for the in the finance industry. And so, of course, we were really gratified to, to get the press and that they are taking note of uh, the bill that's been introduced. And then finally, a couple things that we're working on this summer summer attractions. Um, we have resolutions that are being introduced into the Council of State Governments West and also the National Conference of State Legislatures. So these are uh, roundups of legislators, state legislators. Uh, they are extremely important meetings. They attract hundreds, uh, if not thousands of participants. And uh, we have supporters and resolutions being introduced into both. Now, one of our goals for um, this summer is to actually send some representatives to the NCSL that is being held in Indianapolis uh, in 2023. And um, as um, I'm sure probably most of you know, we are a grassroots nonprofit organization. We depend, we exist uh, based on the generosity of our, our donors and our supporters. And so if any of you are so inclined and would be able to uh, donate, we'd really appreciate it. And this would help us send representatives to the NCSL. And the plan is to go there and lobby uh, hundreds of the attendees to get them to vote in favor of supporting that resolution. And one of the important things there is um, we hope that that resolution is actually endorsed by the entire body because then that's something that we're able to come back and uh, use that when we are um, getting appointments and meetings with your uh, congressional representatives and senators. So it's an extremely important meeting. Also, if um, you have airline miles that you might wanna donate, of course, we would be happy to get those also so that we would be able to um, save our money to pay for advertising in newspapers and media in your community and use airline miles to send our representatives to Indianapolis. Okay. Now, let's go to, to the Q&A. We had some great presentations, uh, some very thought-provoking provo presentations. And if you have a comment or a question, please raise your hand uh, and we will call on you. And I see Joe Polito has got his hand up. Joe, you're muted. Did you have a question or a comment? Hi, uh, terrific presentation as always, presentations. <laughs> um, a comment, I have a question and a comment. Um, the comment is that this whole brilliant plan reminds me of Keynes's uh, paper, How to Pay for the War. Um, 
uh, it means an enormous reallocation of resources, and that's another challenge, I think, for you because it would reduce somewhat the consumer economy. Um, and the other comment I would make is that Professor Liebert mentioned uh, in passing FDR's Bill of Economic Rights, which I think should be the number one goal of social justice activists. Uh, it would uh, do so much for so many, and it would really unite the nation. Uh, nobody could object to such uh, universal benefits. Uh, my question is, have you, um, has, has NIB looked at public banking in Germany as another example of a successful utilization of your strategy? I gather that something like half the German banks are really uh, not for profit and uh, return profits to the community and are focused more on infrastructure and so forth and productive businesses. Um, so that's my question for whoever uh, may have some knowledge of that. Thanks so much again for a great presentation. Thank you. Um, Alfeca, do you know uh, about German banks? Are they, do they have multiple infrastructure banks there? Actually, the uh, the best one to answer this question, I think, is Ellen, because uh, she's familiar with the Strassenberg or, or, or maybe Nomi as well. Uh, yeah, they do have a centralized public bank, and then they have offshoots of it too. Uh, and uh, they're a very good model for us. We can do the same. Either Ellen or 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 Nomi. Yeah, well, they do have local public banks that uh, are limited to their their local area, but of course they're not doing infrastructure. And then they have a big national infrastructure bank, which between the two of them they funded the green revolution or you know the green energy revolution in Germany. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know that NIB has looked at that model, but it definitely is a functional model that we could consider. Mm, okay, thanks for bringing that up, Joe. Um, I'd like to um, throw a question out for, for Derek. Um, in his presentation, he had mentioned uh, the mission of government and what it should rightly be. And you know, one of the comments that we sometimes, or I guess I should say it's an objection that we sometimes get from legislators when we're talking to them is that, They'll say, oh, I'm a small government guy or gal, and so I'm just opposed on principle to any expansion of the government. What, what would you tell somebody about the, the importance or the role of a, a national bank, uh, Derek? Abraham Lincoln might have had the most succinct and penetrating observation on the role of government. And he simply said that it was to enable people to accomplish things that they were unlikely to accomplish alone as individuals. That to Lincoln was the role of the central government. You're not gonna build a national highway system. You're not going to have a, a national system of healthcare or prevention of soil erosion, simply through rugged individualism. I think we can go back and cite Lincoln on this, getting his specific quote about the role of government is there not to intrude, but to enable the citizens to do what they cannot do individually. I also wanted to respond to a previous excellent observation on the great economist John Maynard Keynes, who wrote prolifically in the 1930s and indeed who met with Franklin Roosevelt at least twice. Keynes was flabbergasted at the disunity of American life in the early 30s. He urged Americans to form one country rather than a disparate grouping of 48 separate contending states. And this was the accomplishment of Franklin Roosevelt and his administration to move toward an understanding of a united polity of the United States. None of that rescuing of civilization during the Great Depression, let alone during World War II, could have been accomplished by rugged individualism or a pre-New Deal 
the United States. There had to be a collective effort, and that's what was achieved. And it indeed is much of the model of the lives we're living today. Thank you, Derek. Appreciate that. Um, you, you know, uh, the it's a when you think about what Lincoln said um, that government should do what individuals can't do for themselves. You know, one of the other uh, comments that we've gotten from people is that why should government be out financing infrastructure because we have all these banks, big banks that can do it, but you know, of course they're not really. And I'd like to go to Nomi. She spent much of her career in uh, the big banking world. And Nomi, what do you think? Are the big banks um, gonna come out and be um, one of our opponents in getting this National Infrastructure Bank established? Uh, did they lobby against the bill allowing for state banks in California? How, how are they gonna view public banking? You're muted. I think in general, and, and Ellen knows this, this is very well on the public banking side in, in California and all the sorts of um, negations that the major banks have against anybody playing in what they consider to be their playground, which is that on the surface, they don't want anybody in their playground, not because they want to be um, the organizations to provide loans um, on, to, you know, long-term infrastructure loans, which, which they actually back away from because they prefer, you know, sort of shorter term types of transactions anyway, especially now um, with, with sort of more volatile banking uh, industry in general and, and markets. Um, they, they don't want any kind of bank that, that isn't them. Um, but at the same token, I, 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 I feel, and this, this happened with um, the World Bank, right, that, that um, it, it was basically, you know, the old sort of chase uh, CEOs and presidents at the time that the World, Book, um, World Bank was, was created um, that became advocates of, of the bonds that the World Bank was issuing because they looked at it um, as, as those bonds being things that they could sell, um, that they could make fees on. Um, and John McCloy, who was the, the, the second president of the World Bank, became also, as, as it were, the, this, um, the CEO of Chase after that, um, and actually sort of bridged that, that concept of there being a, a, an international, you know, as it were, an infrastructure uh, organization, um, not perfect, but, but in the vein of, of producing financing and loans for uh, development projects. Again, not perfect, but that therefore uh, Chase could get involved as a broker. And I remember when I first worked at Chase um, back a number of decades ago, um, that some of the analysis that we had on sort of what was then old green, like sticky computer paper um, had to do with IBRD bonds and had to do with, um, you know, so the coupons that these bonds were paying or the interest that these bonds were paying uh, to the bondholders that Chase was finding. Um, and acting as a broker um, in, in the middle of. So I, I think, yes, banks don't want any other banks to be in their playground, but there is a way, particularly with the National Infrastructure Bank, um, to incentivize them um, to be quiet about that you know, concern um, and recognize it as a potential um, sort of economic win for them. They don't have to make the loan. They don't have to worry about the financing. They don't have to get involved with like cities and states and local, which they don't want to do anyway, because it's a hassle and there's regulations and all sorts of things. There'll be this other bank that does it, um, but they can potentially be involved in, in, in selling bonds that that bank um, issues onto, onto their customers, which could be anyone. They could be, um, you know, so the, the markets themselves, they could be individual, um, customers of those institutions and so forth. So I think it's in the way that we actually present it um, to them uh, that, that I think banks could and should get on board in this particular um, situation. Uh, that's great to hear, Nomi, because we do have sort of a problem. Where are we going to get the liquidity in this with interest rates over 5%? <laughs> so that's a great idea. Of course, the National Infrastructure Bank did issue bonds. They weren't a depository bank. Exactly. And, and, and that's the whole thing. Banks, and, and this was one of the issues of the, with, with kind of them being against public banks, um, perhaps not being able to get in between, um, you know, being those, those brokers of, of whatever bonds were issued by public banks, that would be a thing. But on an infrastructure bank level, you actually have, you know, a metric, you actually have sort of economic development or, or, or fees from a high speed railway or, or um, you know, money that's being made from consumers on, on additional electricity provision or whatever it might be, there's actually a way to monetize sort of returns on bonds to, to brokers. 
Yeah, um, that's great. At the end of the day, all banks really are, you know, much as they, they think they're not, they, they, that's, that's what they are. They're brokers and traders. So. Hmm. All right. Thank you. Hey, um, we've had another question come in for uh, Derek. And uh, in the title of your book, you uh, talk about Roosevelt's four lieutenants. So who were they and uh, what did they do? Well, this is a fascinating and unknown part of the Roosevelt administration. There were only four top officials who stood by him from beginning to end over those dozen years and who had powerful hands-on operating roles. The first was Harry Hopkins, who had a de facto position as Secretary of Public Welfare. He was in charge of the Works Progress Administration of getting the money out there to employ people when unemployment was above 20%. And during World War II, he then became mm. FDR's closest political military advisor. The second of these key closest associates was Harold Ickes, an incredibly powerful Secretary of the Interior, who took on responsibility for all public uh, infrastructure projects. Well, Her Harry Hopkins was the WPA, Work Progress Administration, and Harold Ickes was the, uh, in charge of infrastructure. And it was Ickes who oversaw the building of dams, much of the electrification, the building of tunnels and also became energy czar during World War II. The third of FDR's closest associates from beginning to end was Frances Perkins, the first woman to serve in a presidential cabinet, really the driver of the New Deal, of the reforms that we know today, anti-child labor, social security, workers' rights. And during World War II, she was vital to mobilizing the female workforce. And the fourth of the closest lieutenants was Henry Wallace, who ran the biggest government department during the 1930s. That was agriculture. And then who became vice president during FDR's third term. These were superb operators. They arrived in Washington with plans of what needed to be accomplished. FDR, with his keen ability to identify talent, sought them out and enabled each of them to soar. But here is what historians have not recognized. Each of those four, by no accident, was as crippled as the polio-stricken president himself. Each of them had terrible physical and emotional infirmities. Harry Hopkins might be the best known for his horrible handicaps of having two thirds of his stomach removed because of cancer, and then a record of self-destruction with heavy drinking. Harold Ickes was what we now call bipolar, and in those days was uh, known as manic depressive, although he wouldn't be diagnosed until 1945 when it was all over. There were days upon days in government when Harold Ickes simply could not speak, and he self-medicated himself with Nembutal and whiskey. Frances Perkins had a nearly pathological sadness and loneliness to her. She said it pained her physically to see her picture in the paper. And she had a, a tragic, tragic family life where her husband institutionalized for mental illness, as was her daughter. FDR knew all of this, which is why he drew the mirror in addition to their brilliant abilities. And finally, Henry Wallace, as new evidence discloses, was on the autism scale. He had an intellect 
that enabled him to speak as an equal with Einstein and with Keynes. But he had an exceedingly awkward demeanor with those individuals who were closest to him, his colleagues and indeed his children and wife. It's no accident that FDR, whom Eleanor said only felt comfortable around outcasts, <laughs> drew in his fellow unfortunates. But like FDR, and this is where the title of the book comes from, they were all heroic in their ability to overcome their physical and emotional challenges. But not Jesse Jones, right? No, Jesse Jones was not part of the inner circle. Okay. He uh, indeed didn't last the full administration. As you know, FDR fired him in January 1945. With our four, there was no example of no instance of corruption that I've been able to uncover. Uh, whereas with FDR himself, as with Jesse Jones, they did a lot of corner cutting. So the four lieutenants are the, the core enduring unit, and they were all friends, by the way, that got so much accomplished during the 1930s and with victory in World War II that would have been very unlikely to be achieved without them. Hmm, very interesting. Thank you for that insight. Um, I We're going to go back to calling on folks who have their hands up, and then I'm going to give advance warning. We have some local state and local legislators on the line, so I'd like to uh, call on them and give them an opportunity maybe to talk a little bit about um, their support for the National Infrastructure Bank. So let's go with Don. Don, you've got your hand up. Do you have a question or a comment? Yes, I don't have a question tonight, but I do have a, a comment. I really want to get El Faca Mutardi on national television at some point. We are not going to be able to do this unless we get Americans do what pay attention to what's on television. And there's one show called Varney and Company on Fox Business, Stuart Varney, V is in Victor, A R N E Y. A lot of Republicans watch his show, but Varney is also very acutely aware of the importance of manufacturing and infrastructure. He does another show called America Built. He did a whole show on the Hoover Dam and the importance of Hoover Dam to the economy. Fridays are a special day because you can email his production people, varneyviewers at foxbusiness.com. We have about 60 people on this show. If his producers got tomorrow, 60 emails asking to put Alfeca Mutardi on to present information on the National Infrastructure Bank. I think we got a chance. That's Varney Viewers at foxbusiness.com. And everyone that's listening to the sound of my voice, I'd really like to have him do it. I agree Great. with everything that's been said today, but there's a lot of the truth of the matter is there's a lot of preaching to the choir on this type of show. We've got to start preaching to people that are not in the choir and Fox Business, not Fox News itself, that ain't gonna work, but varneyviewers.com, varneyviewers at foxbusiness.com, I think we got a chance. Thanks. Great, great idea, Don. And how, how do you spell it again, V-A-R-N-E-Y? Yes, V-A-R-N-E-Y. And you can All only right. send that email on Fridays. That's the, the only day they take it. All right, make a note, Tomorrow's everyone. Tomorrow's Friday. First thing tomorrow, get Sorry. in your email. Can I can uh, I interrupt for a second? What was the sure. name that we're supposed to ask for? Alfeca. Wave at everybody. Mutardi. We want Alfeca Mutardi on that show. She's got to think she can do it in five minutes. Yeah. She's the chief chief economist for the National Infrastructure Bank Coalition. Wonderful. That was a great idea, Don. Okay. Um. Next, I will. I'd like to call on uh, Merton Simpson. He is a local legislator um, from, I don't really remember, New Jersey. Merton, are you on the phone? There he is. Yeah, I'm, I'm in Albany, New York. And of okay. course, I, I support everything that the National Inf Infrastructure Bank stands for. But without getting into specific names, could, could we... we could, could we get an update on, you know, what kind of support we have from some of the so-called woke progressives like Elizabeth Warren, you know, uh, Bernie Sanders, et cetera, 
I mean, where are these folks nowadays? You don't, I don't, I'm not asking for specific names, but uh, are, are, are we getting any support from them or any recognition from them? Well, um, let me just say that we have a lot of progressives that are supporters within the coalition, and we really appreciate all their, their efforts to help move this legislation forward. So we have um, contacted many of the progressives in the legislature, and um, to date, some of the, you know, we might say superstars like um, Bernie Sanders, uh, who is now the chair of the HELP committee, has said he's really focusing his attention on that. So not to say they're not supporters of the legislation, but they are not, uh, have not to this date been willing to sign on to it. That being said, we are continuing to make a lot of progress. Uh, we've been holding serious conversations with uh, multiple senators, and we hope to have a companion bill introduced in the Senate. And, um, you know, of course, the bill was just reintroduced into the House, and we're back on to uh, going out to our House of Representative members and asking them to co-sponsor. So, um, so we've done a huge amount of work. We have a lot of progressives within the coalition. And one of our big asks here at the end of this meeting is going to be for everybody on this call to go back to your congressperson and ask to set up a meeting. Uh, whether they're um, uh, Republicans or Democrats or um, you know anybody in between, uh, we wanna set up meetings and try to get their support. So um, good point. Uh, thank you for asking. And we're gonna continue uh, pushing that. Okay, we're gonna take another one of our uh, folks with his hand up. Uh, we've got Stephen Sitting. Do you have a question or a comment? I have a question. Uh, I wonder if one of our speakers uh, could give us like the three by five card explanation of what the governance structure of this NIB would be. Is it gonna be run by Congress? Will Congress have a lot of inter input? Federal Reserve, will it be a cabinet level kind of position? Uh, how is this gonna be set up? Well, I, I don't know if we can put it on a three by five card because the actual bill is what, 65, 85 pages long. I, you know, it's quite extensive in terms of what it covers, but I'm gonna let um, Alfeca briefly address uh, the governance or the, the structure of the proposed infrastructure bank. You're muted. Sorry, we do sort of have a three by five card. Um, uh, we got, get often get the question asked, how is the NIB going to be effectively managed? Uh, and uh, so we pull up our example of uh, Jesse Jones uh, managing the Reconstruction Finance Corporation. Um, he uh, rolled out a lot of loans uh, and they all got built, built well. Uh, they used the same, um, they were, it was an independent agency that set up projects, but it was answerable to Congress. Similarly, our National Infrastructure Bank will use uh, similar procedures. It'll have a board of directors that'll approve projects. Um, the list of the projects that it can cover are already set out in the bill, um, the same as that I showed you on that earlier table. In addition, this is a deposit taking bank. So it uses the same commercial rules as any commercial bank uses. It, uh, it's, uh, the legislation is actually its charter for, um, for operations. Uh, the officers um, uh, do all the normal things that banks do, like loan uh, risk officers and compliance officers and checking up on loans. Uh, there'll be a lot of um, enforcement to make sure that these loans get out into rural areas and that they uh, uh, equitably distribute the projects so that everybody has a chance to get um, access to jobs and to um, construction work out of all of these loans that are given out. And then we will have, in addition, like the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, back office engineers and lawyers to assist local governments who may not have the capacity to effectively um, put together a loan, a project loan, and then manage that loan uh, because they're too small of a government, uh, you know, a, a government organization, and they've lost their technical people. So we can have help them with back office um, um, technical support to make sure that the loans roll out 
that nothing is misallocated, that all of the loans are executed on time, on budget, and there's no malfeasance. And I think the Reconstruction Finance Corporation was a great example. We've tightened up a lot of the uh, rules in the legislation to make sure that this bank is managed effectively. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Thanks, Alfeca. Um, uh, you can also um, actually pull down that I believe that the actual bill is now posted, so you would be able to pull it down. Alfeca, do you know, is, is it up now? So uh, interested people could actually pull the, the last, bill down. The last, and... time I, the last time I looked, it, it was not up. But you can pull okay. up three, uh, HR 3339 under the last session. Very similar wording uh, in the statute. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, next I would like to go with, um, let's see, we have from the great state of Indiana where the um, the uh, conference is going to be held. We have, um, is it Representative Patricia Boy on the line? Devices that yes, I am, but it's very noisy here, so I'll be quick. I'm really interested okay. in this. I am going to the conference in, in um, August, and I'm really looking forward to it. Great. Well, thank you. Uh, perhaps we'll actually get to meet you in person. So that would be wonderful. Um, okay. That's wonderful Let's... for me anyway. <laughs> All right. Um, okay. Um, Ellen brought up one of my favorite subjects, which is reshoring manufacturing uh, and using the National Infrastructure Bank to be able to make those kinds of investments. Would any of our experts here, the economists, like to comment on what kinds of facilities could a national infrastructure bank finance that would make our manufacturing industries more competitive. Who's who's got some thoughts on that? We've got multiple economists on the line. Nomi, you, you want to take a stab at that? Yeah, I mean, just real quick and, and sort of reconnecting back into the the energy as, as one major component of infrastructure because power powers all of the rest of our, our infrastructure in some in some manner. But um, to the extent that we have more commercial manufacturing plants that actually are being built um, predominantly in the Midwest, um, but that, you know, th this this National Infrastructure Bank can, can continue to make dents in building um, some of those new factories, some of the additional manufacturing jobs that would come from that, um, I think is something that would be of interest to all of those states and all of those legislators in, in those areas that are already seeing some of that movement happen um, mm -hmm. and also can help us in general uh, from the standpoint of economic security on, on the renewable side and on the, again, upgrading and updating the power grid to make sure that new energy sources get from their uh, source point to um, to everybody in the country. We had um, make, make a couple, couple comments on that if I might. I mean, part of part of what we we went through as a country was a, a bill of goods was sold to a lot of our, our, our manufacturing sector to go to what's called just in time inventory, rather than sustaining a, an inventory of goods so they could keep producing for a few months. They went to just in time inventory and avoided those costs, and then offshored this, their supplies, so they became totally dependent on getting key go goods whether it's a computer chip or, or a, a, a valve or whatever it might be from offshore. And I think what we really need to do, and I think Biden and the people around him uh, on his council and so forth are very aware of this, that if we're going to have, it's, it's a matter of national security, both economically and even militarily, to basically re restore the idea that we have to have a key, the key, as much as possible, the key supply chains have to be domestic. Because if your factories are offshore, you're really very, very, very vulnerable. And the other part of this, of course, was the motivation for going offshore was it was cheaper to hire someone in Vietnam or China than an American worker. And uh, you know, we're we're going to have to address that issue of, of you know reasonable wage levels and what have you. But it didn't just happen. I mean, the deindustrialization of America didn't just happen. And by the way, it is Trump's constituency. I mean, basically, tr Trump has a constituency of people who have absolutely legitimate grievance of having seen the industries they depended upon for generations destroyed. And uh, we're going to have to rebuild those. That's right. I, I totally agree with that. You know, I have a question for um, Derek, is, if he's still on the line. But, you know, you are a professor of uh, of 
managing technology. And when we deindustrialized, we sent all of our old style factories, the ones that were labor intensive, they were dismantled, packed up and shipped to China. But when we reshore manufacturing, are we gonna be able to have smart factories and automated production, automated manufacturing? And will that allow us to be more competitive? We don't want those old style factories back, do we? Um, Andy, what do you think about that? Are we gonna get new style manufacturing back? We certainly can and we should. And, and again, Germany is one of, one of the models. I mean, you know, Germany is, is building factories that are amazing in terms of the you know auto, automation and all the rest of it, but that doesn't address the issue of of employment and what have you. You know, if we're going to really be successful at this, we have got to convince American people that they're going to be jobs, not just robots. So it's it's it's, it's a dual-edged sword. I'm glad you brought that up because I did want to take a moment to uh, recognize Lou Spencer. He's a representative from labor uh, out of Virginia, and he's been a, a, a participant in many of our calls. Uh, Lou, would you, would you like to maybe address um, the labor question? We, we get that a lot in terms of where are you going to find workers? Where are you going to find the right kind of workers? Lou, are you are you on the line? I know he was just there a minute ago. There he is. Lou, you're muted. I probably, have, I probably have to give people more advance notice before I call on them. Okay, we're gonna go back to some of our other people. I have Tim waving a sign at me. Tim, your hand is up and you're muted, but did you have a question or a comment? Yes. One more. Uh, when will I start seeing the historic national infrastructure bank movement on the likes of MSNBC, CNN, and Fox? When will I see Barbara Lee and other pro-NIV politicians touting the NIV on my TV? Well, you know what we've been told is that we have to get to critical mass and that is where we are going to reach out to all of you and ask for your help in achieving critical mass. And by that, I mean, we need to reach back out to our representatives and our senators and get them to agree to be co-sponsors. Um, I think that uh, Don's proposal that we all email um, Fox News, uh, varneyviewers.com uh, tomorrow is an excellent idea. Uh, to get us some more publicity so that we are very well aware of the need to um, to bring our message uh, to more mainstream media outlets. So we are working on that very diligently. So thank you for your question. And I see um, Joe has his hand up again. Do you have another question? Uh, yes, um, I was very interested in Professor Liebert's book and I was wondering if he, um, had considered adding uh, Mariner Eccles, the best Fed chair ever, who went on national radio in 1939 and decimated Senator, Senator Burns' desire for a debt ceiling. His speech uh, is available on the St. Louis Fed, and I just can't imagine Powell doing that with the crazy Republicans today. And also, uh, Nomi, perhaps you could address the concern that the big banks will lobby against this because they would deem it as crowding out the private sector. Thanks very much. You know, me, do you have a quick answer for Joe? Yeah, no, I, I, I think again, as, as I said before, banks don't want anybody um, to take away their, their power, their control over um, anything in finance. But I do think to the extent that um, we have a communication with them and also with sponsors who might be concerned about banks who actually also pay for them to sit in their chairs, um, that there are bonds that we can issue um, from the infrastructure bank that these banks can actually sell or invest in themselves and sort of in that way participate um, sort of in the in an upside role uh, for what's coming out of the National Infrastructure Bank as in return for just sort of staying out of its way. Um, but I think it's it, it's necessary to address that issue. I think it's really important because almost uh, well, not almost every, but many uh, senators and Congress people um, are actually financed in some capacity by the major banks. We know this. And so um, I think that's actually part of what we should be saying anyway. Like before you ask that question, um, this is how you would answer the problem 
of, of a major bank getting getting in the way of this particular bill. Again, they didn't get in the way of the World Bank um, infrastructure bonds, and, and they shouldn't really shouldn't get in the way of, of, of these, but we have to, I think, just preempt it. Thanks, Tommy. Uh, we're going to see if we can get you lined up to handle some of those inquiries from the big banks, or you can be our sort of our advanced squad to go in and deflect them. So they love me. I wouldn't talk to the banks. That's the whole point. I'd be talking to the Congress people and the senators who are concerned that their bank supporters have problems. So there's no point in talking to the banks. There's just okay. it's deflecting at source. I think it's really important. Um, it, you know, in, in my world, we call it objection handling, right? So you know you're going to get an objection from somebody about something. Well, you have to be prepared for the answer. You know, the big banks will say, "Hey, that's not fair." Well. You know, this is why we think it is fair that you will be able to participate, we'll cooperate and, and that sort of thing. So well, and also the banks don't want to take 10, 15, 20 year risk, right? They just want to be in the way of potentially that money going away from them. So if there's an argument to be made that some of those coupons, some of the interest payments are going to go to them in some way anyway, um, then that's just, again, a way to deflect it from, from the concerns of um, our elected officials. Right. Thank you. Um, okay, we're going to try Ava Diaz again. Ava, are you there and unmuted? Would you like to say a few words? I'm just excited about the opportunity for for uh, people to have employment and and uh, everything that this NIB would offer to to Arizona. So I am always going to be in support of it. Thank you. We we really appreciate it. Um, it's been a joy working with you. Uh, okay, let's go to um, another person from the uh, from the Southwest. Uh, we have Dennis Montoya here. He's from New Mexico, which has also been hugely affected by the mega drought. Dennis, do you have a, a question or a comment? I have a comment to your point, Julie, that we need to reach critical mass. Uh, as many of you know, I'm a high school teacher. Uh, I think young people are the key to everything. Alfeca has a video that I believe was recorded. It's the title of her presentation was The National Infrastructure Bank, What is Not to Like? A huge beneficiary of these 25 million jobs that would be created would be youth. And I think we need to get that video out. I, need, I think we need to get it on TikTok, on Instagram, and the media that these young people watch and pay attention to, um, because I think that will help us in reaching critical mass. I think that is a great idea. Uh, we are on Facebook right now, and um, uh, I don't think we're on tw TikTok, but, you know, perhaps that's something we should look into. So yeah, um, I, I got to tell you, my kids regard Facebook as for us old people. Yeah, yeah, I think you're right about appealing to young people. I think. Um, I think we need to uh, to work on that. And if we have any uh, younger folks here in the audience that might want to help us out and give us some uh, strategic advice on what to do, we would appreciate it. Okay, um, Craig Schwartz from the great state of Ohio, you've got your hand up. Do you have a comment or a question? Uh, quick question. You mentioned that uh, August date for the Indy uh, conference. So what exact date is that? You, you just mentioned August, but I didn't get a date. I believe it's um, like the 14th, 15th, and 16th, maybe the 17th of um, August. So okay. it's in Indianapolis. Um, as I understand it, there are a lot uh, of legislators that go. It's very well attended. And so we have a resolution that is going to be submitted at that conference. And our intent is we would like to um, send a few people. And if others wanted to show up like you, Craig, which, you know, Indianapolis, I don't know how far a drive is that from Ohio. It's a hop, but it's, it's a hop, but it's a it's Yeah, so perhaps you'd like to, you know, come down also. Yeah. Our plan is, is to um, hang out in the conference center lobby and just hit people up and, and say, hey, we're here representing the National Infrastructure Bank. Like to chat with you for a few minutes about the benefits. And so we really think that would be a great idea to, um, to gain more supporters. And, and we really want to see this resolution get through um, and be um, uh, you know, approved by the, by the whole conference. So if anybody else in the area um, might be interested in uh, showing up there or helping us with donations or, or uh, airline miles so that we could send a couple of our organizers, that would be awesome. Okay. Um, Amtrak, goes, Amtrak goes to Indianapolis. 
there we go. We could, you know, test out the infrastructure and, and you know, uh, get a, give them a full report on, on uh, you know, the experience. It's not like high speed rail in Europe, that's for sure. Uh, okay, um, any other questions or comments? Um, we're uh, kind of getting to the point where we're gonna wrap up our meeting. Uh, Miriam, I saw that maybe you had your hand up. No, just the young person to help out with TikTok. If you- <laughs> Oh, do you want to help out? That would be fabulous. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So uh, one of the slides I'm going to be putting up is going to have our contact information. So if you can just get with us and then we'll maybe get a plan together, we'll get you with our social media person and perhaps we can just start up a new um, strategy and get to work on TikTok. And I don't know if you have to have funny videos or they have to be short or uh, what the deal is there, but if you're up I'll on take that. care of that end. Yeah, I'll take care of that. All right, that would be wonderful. Okay, uh, James, you've got your hand up. Do you have a quick uh, comment or a question? Yeah, the comment I have is uh, that I, I don't want to leave this meeting without mentioning that wonderful uh, aqueduct project that's part of the uh, <clears throat> part of the plan for the uh, National Infrastructure Bank. It's something that it's a project that I think is a very good hook. Uh, for elected officials, people that are on water boards, those kinds of things in the Southwest, and even into the uh, seven states that uh, are facing uh, federally imposed rationing uh, because of the uh, of uh, you know of the low levels of the uh, of, of Lake Mead and Lake Powell, uh, and uh, so I just wanted to mention that for some of the some of the participants who may not have heard of this, uh, but are more are interested in the National Infrastructure Bank and what it can do. Thank you, James. For those of you who aren't aware, um, one of our supporters, Don Seifkes, who um, was on the, the meeting earlier and actually had asked a question, he um, is a proponent of this plan and he's actually done uh, quite a bit of work around it, but it's to take water from an offshoot of the Mississippi River, which has lots of water, and um, transport it over to the Southwest to, um, is it Mead? Uh, well, there's Lake Mead, but there's, you know, um, what is the dam that he wants it's to? It's Powell. It goes oh. to Powell. And actually it, the aqueduct could be shorter because there's a tributary to Powell yeah. that's several hundred miles long that it can it could flow into. Yeah, so this could all be done. I mean, we have the engineering capability in our country to be able to do this. It's water that is not needed in Louisiana. They have plenty of water the way it is. And so it's water that could be taken from there and moved over to uh, a huge area of the country that's desperately in need. I mean, they're saying that 40 million people, when you're talking about uh, Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, Los Angeles, um, that you know potentially could be without water. So it's a, a, a serious, serious issue. And there's a solution for it. And if we still had Derek on the line, we could ask him about the oil pipelines that were built just prior to World War II um, to transport oil from Texas to the East Coast where it was desperately needed. And those oil pipelines were built in a very short amount of time to address a critical national need. So we have that capability. We have the engineering expertise. We have that ability to, to do that, of course, financing uh, would be uh, an issue, but that's something the National Infrastructure Bank could address. So, um, and I believe we had um, an op-ed in, in USA Today on that. So for those of you who are interested, you can Google, um, what it, what is it called, James? Is there an official title to it, the aqueduct? Yeah. Well, it's, uh, I don't know if we have a title, but if you, it, it, it comes from the Atchafalaya River in southern Louisiana is where is where that water comes from. Uh, I don't know if that would be a um, you know a, a, a hot word that you could search, but uh, and I don't know if we have a we have a, a name for it yet. But one of the things I might mention is that the estimate of the cost through this bank is between fifteen and twenty billion dollars. It's not a lot of money, and uh, and as you mentioned, Julie, we have precedent with these two very large oil pipelines that were built in the middle of the century to supply oil for the World War II effort up to the uh, up to the East Coast from Texas. Yeah, 
Thank you. Uh, good point. Okay, um, we have reached our time limit, so we are going to wrap it up. I have a couple slides I want to show you, so please stay on the line. And um, uh, this is an organizing flyer that we have on our website, so please go to our website, nibcoalition.com. Uh, you'll find this flyer. You can download it and print it out and um, hand it to your, your city representative or your state and local representatives or senators. And so again, any of these actions that you take are really going to help us reach that critical mass that we need in order to get on national TV as Tim, uh, you know, is requesting. Okay, next slide. Um, here we go. Here's our bill, HR 4052. This is the, the new number for the bill that has just been reintroduced into Congress. Uh, one of the things that you can do is call your member of Congress and ask them to co-sponsor it. But really what we'd like you to do is call your member of Congress or email them and ask to schedule a meeting with them. And then we will get NIB coalition organizers on the phone with you and your member of Congress and do a little presentation and then ask them to sign on and be a co-sponsor. So again, this is extremely important. Um, you know, all part of these steps that we need to take in terms of getting back to critical mass. In the last Congress, we had 20 co-sponsors. We have um, three right now. We have the, the guy who introduced the bill, Danny Davis, and then Barbara Lee and Eric Swalwell from California, both very important, influential folks in Congress. And we'd like to get the representative from your state as well. So um, you can go to our website. Here you see it again. We have an action page up there. And so please take a look. That's where you're able to um, find the flyer. Okay, um, next slide. Here you go for more information. Um, of course, you can go to our website. Here's our Facebook page. Hopefully, maybe with Miriam's help, we will soon have a, a TikTok channel or whatever you call it. And uh, we're on Twitter. And then there's our email address. So again, what we'd really like to ask everyone to do today is to call or email your congressperson and ask to set up a meeting um, with, um, with us. And um, we're happy to send you, um, if you're going to email your congressperson, send you a, a suggested email that you can send in asking for a meeting. And then, of course, we have the suggestion from Don, which is to email varneyviewers.com and ask to have Alfeca Mutardi on national television. Alfeca, are you up for the challenge? Oh, absolutely. Anytime. <laughs> All right. All right. Love it. Okay. Well, that brings us to the, the end of our meeting this evening. And I want to thank everybody for your attention and, and hope you found our, our session tonight valuable. We really appreciate it. And uh, thanks for supporting the National Infrastructure Bank.